So I know we have some subscribers on this channel, or at least people who have watched a video every now and then, who had the opportunity to see shows at CBGB's, or maybe even play a couple shows at CBGB's. And every time I read those comments, I feel a little bit jealous, because that's that will forever be a venue that I am sad I never got to see a show at. And sure, some of that is probably just the myth that's grown up about CBGB's over the years. Maybe at the time it was just the local dive bar in a seedy part of town, but now it's so much more than that. So what was CBGB's? How did it become the staple of punk music in the American underground music scene? What happened to it? And what was it like when the chili finally ran out? If you end up liking this video, please consider giving it a like. It really helps me in the algorithm, you know, playing to the YouTube overlords. Also, share it with a friend if you think they might enjoy it. And if this kind of like stories of music history is something you enjoy, consider subscribing because I'll hopefully be putting out a lot more of these. It's the late 60s, and New York City isn't exactly the best place to be. The city was all but bankrupt, crime ran rampant in the downtown streets, and faced with this sort of decline, the city started to slash funds for municipal services and government employees. Unemployment rates, which were already high, just kept rising. More and more people started to flee the city for the suburbs in what became known as white flight. But the 60s in New York was also a time of flourishing diversity. It was a time of the LGBT community banding together and fighting for rights. It was a time of civil rights and uh, protests around that. It was a time where artists were able to express themselves with a lot of freedom and a lot more creativity than they had in the past. So a lot of the art scenes in downtown were flourishing with this new found creativity and freedom of expression. Nathaniel Hawthorne once said that all of life is made up of marble and mud, this kind of juxtaposition of the things that are beautiful with the things that are ugly. And you can find that in all of society and all of people even. And I think, I mean, as much as someone who wasn't there can think that that kind of perfectly sums up New York City in the 60s and the early 70s, this just kind of tension between the dirty and the, the scary with also this beautiful flourishing artistic community. And into that world steps Hilly Crystal. Hilly was born in the city in 1931 before moving to New Jersey when he was younger and growing up on a chicken farm. His parents were Russian Jewish immigrants and his father actually survived something called the pogrom which is an anti-Semitic riot that sought to eradicate Jewish people from the Russian Empire. From a very early age, Hilly was interested in music. He actually learned to play the violin as a kid, and that's something that he would keep doing through most of his life. Eventually, he would end up studying at the Settlement Music School in Philadelphia before enlisting in the Marines. Because of his background in performing and entertainment, Hilly was assigned to the Special Services in the Entertainment Division. So he spent his enlistment as a all-purposes entertainer at a radio station based on a base in North Carolina. Kind of between those different radio shows, he taught himself to play guitar, piano, and he started to write country songs, which that country folk genre was always kind of one of his favorites to listen to. After he left the Marines, he moved back to New York City and actually got a job performing in the men's choir at the Radio City Music Hall. Apparently at one point, Hilly was actually pretty close to getting his own recording contract. Uh, Herb Abramson, who was the head of Atlantic Records at the time, heard him and really liked his sound. So when Herb left Atlantic and started his own label, he approached Hilly to sign for that label. And at the time, Hilly also had a lot of interest from Atlantic Records. So Hilly kind of being this, you know, indie guy that he would later become famous for, he thought that he would throw in his lot with the with this new label, mostly because he thought that being the only artist on this new label would give him a lot of attention and they would focus a lot on trying to build his career. So he recorded a few folk songs for that label, but unfortunately the label folded before they were able to release it, so 
that kind of put a stop to his recording career before it even really got started. Hilly would never again try and make it as a performer, but he stuck around the music industry. First, he got a job as a manager at the Village Vanguard, which was a jazz club in Greenwich Village. It first hosted primarily folk and beat poetry, but became a jazz club in 1957. Hilly was responsible for booking in musicians, people like Miles Davis, to play the club. In the 60s, Hilly co-founded the Ryan Gold Central Park Music Festival. The festival featured a range of artists from many different genres, like Fleetwood Mac, Ray Charles, Chris Christopherson, Bob Marley, that kind of thing. But by 1968, Hilly was no longer affiliated with the festival, which would continue to run every summer until 1976. Apparently, according to Hilly's son, when Hilly signed a contract, he agreed in the fine print that he didn't read that if he ever changed sponsors from Rheingold to someone else, he would lose his status as co-founder. So whenever Hilly decided to switch the sponsors from Rheingold to Schaefer, he kind of unknowingly wrote himself out of the whole thing. So instead, Hilly decided to open a restaurant on West 9th Street that he just called Hilly's. He decided to feature like a musical showcase every evening, and sometimes you could even catch Bette Midler performing there during her downtime in Fiddler on the Roof. I guess that restaurant was pretty successful because Hilly was able to open two more, Hilly's on 13th and Hilly's on the Bowery. Originally, Hilly's on the Bowery was kind of like just a biker bar, and Hilly ran it from 1969 until 1972 when things started to pretty drastically change. Hilly decided that he wanted to open a club that would play the kind of music that he loved, this kind of like country and folk style. So he closed down Hilly's on the Bowery, and in that same location, he opened up a club he called CBGB, which stood for Country, Bluegrass, and Blues. When it became apparent that he wasn't going to be only playing country and bluegrass at this club, he added O-M-F-U-G, so it was C-B-G-B, and then lowercase O-M-F-U-G, which stood for Other Music for Uplifting Gormandizers, which a gormandizer is someone with a voracious appetite. And as Hilly described it, he meant it as someone with a voracious appetite for music. And CBGB's officially opened in 1973. Hilly said, quote, Radio stations all over the U.S. were playing country music. Cool jukeboxes were playing blues and bluegrass, as well as folk and country. Also, a lot of my artists' writer friends were always going off to some fiddler's convention or a bluegrass concert or blues and folk festivals, so I thought it would be a whole lot of fun to have my own club with all of this kind of music playing there." End quote. Hilly also had the idea to open up this club and this music venue because there really wasn't another place for it in downtown New York at that time. Bands like the New York Dolls and kind of more avant-garde artistic underground bands used to play at a venue called the Mercer Art Center. That was really the place that was kind of fostering the local rock community in New York City, but unfortunately, that building just collapsed in 1973, so these bands were a little bit homeless. The scene was a little bit lost. When that building collapsed, it really just left a hole in the New York local rock scene, and that was a hole that Hilly thought he could fill. That first year was really tough for Hilly. He wanted to book bands that played their own music. He said, quote, Originality to me was prime. Technique took second place. So no cover bands was his philosophy and that philosophy really just allowed the punk music to to take root and flourish in cbgbs but according to dana hilly's son that rule was only instituted because hilly couldn't afford to pay ascap the performing rights on the already recorded songs so he demanded bands play their own stuff back in 1973 right before it switched from being hilly's on the bowery to cbgbs two local kids asked if they could start booking local bands to play at the club. These local guys, Billy Page and Rusty McKenna, weren't actually musicians themselves, but they loved all of that kind of like craziness associated with people like the New York Dolls. They loved that kind of like pre-punk, somewhat absurdist acts that were all around at the time. And so they started booking bands like that to play, the kind of like pre-punk bands. And one day, someone named Tom Verlaine happened to hear some of these punk bands playing in CBGBs, and he stopped to listen, and then he asked if his band could play. Tom had just kind of formed this new band out of the ashes of a previous band that he had with someone named Richard Hell. They called their new band Television, which was both a play on trying to recapture the most prominent media form of the day in television, and also they liked that it sounded like Tell-A-Vision. The 
band's manager convinced Hilly that it was a good idea to let television play at CBGB's, and they started to play pretty regularly starting in 1974. Television was kind of one of the most influential pre-punk bands. Hilly, understandably and probably justifiably, gets a lot of credit for establishing this place for these early punk bands and this early scene to thrive, but I think a lot of credit also should go to Rusty McKenna and Billy Page. I mean, those were the guys who saw this scene and were probably a part of this scene and convinced Hilly to bring it in. So I think their story gets a little bit lost in the history of CBGBs, and I think it's important to kind of highlight them as people who really were very responsible for the birth of punk. I mean, without them convincing Hilly to let in bands like Television who we'd probably never be talking about CBGBs at all. At that time, the Lower East Side was not really a place you wanted to be. Well, I mean, maybe it was for some people, but it's not a place you would see like the Cleaver family hanging out and catching a Broadway show. Hilly said that above CBGBs was a flop house, and there were several other flop houses on the street, and that was a place where people who are recently released from prison, they would be sent to these flop houses to live. So, Hilly described it as a lot of derelicts, a lot of alcoholics, drug addicts, uh, people with a lot of mental instabilities, just kind of a rough and violent and dirty place to be. But being in that area also did have its advantages. The rent was very reasonable, especially considering what it would be now to rent that same location. And Hilly said the neighbors wouldn't care at all about loud rock music in the middle of the night. And he also said the kind of people who are coming to these early punk shows didn't necessarily care about stepping over a passed out drunk on the side of the road in order to get into the club. But it also led to some pretty aggressive and violent people trying to get into the bar that they would have to try and keep out. In 1975, Tom, the guy from television, brought his friend Patty Smith to CBGB's. And Patty Smith kind of fell in love with it. She was already kind of known as a poet, this kind of underground indie poet at the time, but After seeing television and seeing bands play at CBGB's, she started her own group that she called the Patti Smith Group and started to play at CBGB's almost weekly. She played her first show at CBGB's on February 14th, 1975. And she brought in, since she was already kind of well-known, she brought in a lot of people, and that is seen as the initial spark of the punk heyday in CBGB's. The Ramones had previously played at CBGB's, but, I mean, no one knew who they were at the time. They were just a local band who weren't very good trying to find their sound. So Patti Smith, who was already an established artist, gave a lot of street cred to CBGB's. Patti said, quote, There was no real venue in 1973 for people like us. We didn't fit. We didn't fit into the cabarets or the folk clubs, end quote. So Hilly gave them a place to play and work out their set. Hilly had two rules for CBGBs that really kind of fostered this creative atmosphere. His one that we've already talked about was no covers, have to play original music, but his other was that bands had to carry their own equipment. There was no roadies allowed. So this really kind of helped influence that whole DIY feel of punk music. Sure, some of those bands were terrible. I mean, even Hilly famously hated the Ramones. He said that by the time they got their set worked down to 17 minutes, he was so happy because he could handle 17 minutes, but not much more than that of the Ramones. But then there were also a lot of other bands that were doing really refreshing and innovative and awesome things that we still talk about today. CBGB's also kind of fitting with the feel of the Lower East Side at the time wasn't necessarily the cleanest place to see a show. Uh, Marky Ramone said that Hilly owned a dog that he would never walk, so the dog would just go wherever he wanted and people would often step in dog poop and find themselves sliding around and not sure why. The bathroom at the venue was also kind of famously terrible. It was dirty. People would do all sorts of illicit and illegal things in there, and it was covered with graffiti. I mean, the whole venue was, but I think it started in the bathroom. It was covered with graffiti from bands and fans that would go there, and Hilly just kind of left it, didn't care. And it's created an iconic look now, but at the time, it might have been a little dingy. When it first started, CBGB's also had a kitchen, and it would offer food to its guests, and the chili has become kind of famous. Uh, It would just be left in a pot to simmer in the kitchen, and as you might expect, Hilly didn't necessarily care about health code violations, so who knows what would end up in that chili. There were rats scurrying around, there was cigarette ash, there was band sneaking back to, the rumor has it, sneaking back to add things into the chili. So whenever regulars saw 
new people eating the chili, they would be a little bit sketched out by it. I also think it's worth noting that as the legend of CBGB's grows, so does the amount of people who claim to have been there and been a part of it. Uh, people have said that at the time, like, there were no more than 200 people at any given show, sometimes much less than that. I mean, the people who were playing there, at least in the early days, weren't well known. I mean, we have this image in our head of people like Blondie and the Talking Heads and the Ramones and Patti Smith and all of these legendary, iconic bands playing at this little venue, but there was also hundreds of other bands who we've never heard of and probably never will who are also playing there and you know weren't as good weren't as iconic weren't as innovative so it's worth noting that in our heads we can kind of explode this into this like super cool scene but at the time it it was a little touch and go there and also it's also worth noting that a lot of the people who claim to have been a part of that scene maybe weren't. By 1976, CBGBs had started to grow in stature and popularity to the point that it was attracting bands outside of New York City. Hilly said that he had connections with clubs in Boston, and a lot of cool Boston bands were coming up, so he would book bands to play in CBGBs from Boston. And a lot of this has to come from the fact that the Ramones re released their first album in 1976 that was kind of like an underground hit and really spread this New York punk sound out into the world. Blondie also released their debut album in December of 1976. So a lot of the bands that came from this scene were starting to get a lot of traction and that just highlighted CBGBs even more. There was also a group of filmmakers called Metropolis Video that would come and film some of the early scenes and sets at CBGBs, which also increased the fame of it. This all culminated in April of 1977, when The Damned, which was a punk band formed in London in 1976, became the first UK punk band to play shows in the US when they stepped on the tiny CBGB stage. After that, other bands from the slightly more put-together UK punk scene would come over and they started to play CBGBs. And a lot of people say that's kind of when punk was born, was when those UK bands came over, because the early the early punk bands of CBGBs weren't necessarily playing the same thing. No one would say Blondie was playing the same music as the Ramones, but both were kind of punk. So the UK scene was way more put together. The bands sounded more similar in genre, so them coming over and introducing America to that, it, a lot of people see that as kind of the birth of punk. And also that kind of like early punk sound wasn't really in style in the underground anymore. People were way more interested in the hardcore music spearheaded by bands like Minor Threat from Washington, D.C. or Black Flag from California. So Hilly adjusted and he started offering a Sunday matinee for hardcore bands. This would allow bands to play from like the afternoon through the evening. And uh, largely because of Minor Threat and their straight edge lifestyle, Alcohol wasn't such a big thing in the hardcore scene, so and it was for younger people. It was for people under the age of 21 a lot of the times. So these Sunday matinees allowed him to bring in that crowd, the crowd of 17 to 19-year-old kids who weren't drinking but also still keep the profits from the night shows where people were drinking a lot of alcohol. But these matinees became so important for the New York, especially hardcore scene, and that just allowed those bands a place to flourish. Unfortunately, violence was also kind of a large part of the hardcore scene. Uh, Ian McKay, this frontman and founder of Minor Threat and punk legend, underground music legend, he said that at the end, it wasn't really even about the music or the scene or the philosophy anymore. It was just kind of about going to a show to be violent and kind of turned off a lot of those founders of the genre, but it also turned Hilly off. And by the 90s, he had banned hardcore shows though he would occasionally book a few in, and by the time that CBGB's closed, there was no ban on any genre of music. In the early 2000s, things started to really fall apart at CBGB's. The Bowery area in the Lower East Side, which, as we talked about, was not the best place to be, had started to get gentrified, which meant rents were spiking. Hilly was sued by his landlord for back rent. The judge ended up siding with Hilly in the venue, saying that the landlord never actually gave notice that the rent was increasing, so how could Hilly pay it? But that was kind of the end of that relationship. And by the time the lease ran out in 2006, Hilly knew he would not be able to afford the increased rent. So he agreed to leave the premises by September 30th, 2006. On October 16th, 2006, Patti Smith was the last artist to take the stage at CBGB's. Richard Lloyd, the guitarist of television, played a few songs with her and 
Towards the end of her set, she played Gloria and added in echoes of Blitzkrieg Bop in the chorus. When Patti Smith left the stage, the club closed its doors. So the awning of CBGB's, at least the one that was there when it closed in 2006, is now in the lobby of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So you can go see it. They For a while, they had like an online store presence, but I don't know if they even have that anymore. But the look and the feel and the image and just the iconicness of CBGB's continues to live on and hopefully always will.